terminate abruptly. You have to have this thing detach. Okay, I don't like to show that, but this just sort of shows you some of the, inter the interesting complexity and things like that. Passing argument is very subtle, and there's a long list of things. You could use to bind to pass it. You could use the variadic constructor itself to pass it. Um, you can use a lambda. These all have essentially do essentially the same thing. And I'm not going to talk about it. I just had a talk in Germany about this actually last two, uh, two weeks ago, actually. Um, and I'm not sure they're going to put that online now. The next one is, of course, this is valid C++ today. And of course, the answer in any kind of a conference or presentation, and when somebody asks that, it's obviously a rhetorical question, and the answer to any rhetorical question is no. <laughs> it's not valid C++ 0390 today, but it is valid in, in 2011 in C++. C++ now, <laughs> today, this I should have, I should have changed that. I wrote these slides well before. I've seen them. Yes. Yes, that's right. Uh, memory yeah. order release that you mean memory order underscore release? I probably do. There's actually an underscore here, but it's too oh. hard to see. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. So this is so all this is doing is saying that X is not atomic, but Y is atomic, and you want to use Y to synchronize access to X, guarantee so and thus guaranteeing the assignment to X is visible. Now the, the next question is are these actually equivalent? And again, the answer is no, it's not equivalent. Um, the reason is actually, even though in effect these two actually do the same thing, and you probably couldn't tell the difference, the subtle difference is that what's on the right side, and what this is demonstrating, of course, is that you can use syntax naturally. Once you have something declared as atomic, then all your assignment here, all reads or writes, are also atomic. Okay? However, the code on the right is, and the code on the right is obviously a lot better than the code on the left because you really don't want to read the code on the left. You want to read the code on the right. In fact, I'm not even sure the code on the left is legal today because we stripped out a lot of C compatibility stuff halfway through the standard. Yeah, go ahead. Is atomic the same thing as the volatile keyword? It is not. Atomic is completely different from the C++ volatile keyword. However, it has some relationship to the Java volatile, which is atomic. Okay. Volatile means that something from my environment, a memory map system, can change me. Atomic means something from another thread can change me. Okay. There's a raging debate going on right now as to whether atomic volatile is actually a useful thing to have to stand it actually at this point. We won't go into that. But I do want to say why this is why this is different. The difference is that this is some of, some of you guys probably know. What's the answer here? Why is these why are these two actually different, even though in effect it's not different? What, what, what? Anyone know? Because the, the default, the default is, is sequential. sequentially consistent. Thank you. What I have done here is I have specifically asked for apply release semantics. Okay. And, in, and for two threads, that's pretty. That's pretty much okay. For multiple, however, here because I have I have done it um, without putting any parameters or anything like that on it. It is by default sequentially consistent. That pretty much means that we're going to be putting fences all the way around, unless your your, your natural loads and stores have have automatic some sort of automatic controls with them. Go ahead. So the, the left side, the common that's code on the left side is equivalent to the right. The sorry. The common is out code on the left. Side. Yeah, the common and out code would actually be be actually equivalent. Okay, so I, I you guys have seen this before. I presented this at this conference. Not so we want to see something new. Um, this is your standard Hello World program again, okay? So what is this program going to print? Well, you probably already know. I'm not going to delay the, the point. Now, I'm going to present you a two-threaded Hello World program with OpenMP, okay? Then the question is, what is this program going to print? Well, you already see, you can see the answer here, and it's not surprising. And I've made this claim before, even in my previous example. Well, I'm not entirely sure whether Hello World will actually come out in order, okay? Here in this particular example, I'm demonstrating quite clearly that what I, and some of you guys may not know what some of these primers are doing, but to be quite honest, it's pretty intuitive. You have a pretty good idea what these things are doing, even without me explaining it in, in too much detail. Um, this is going to print out, this is going to spin up a, a, a parallel region with all the threads that you have, unless you, sim you, you limit it somehow. And it's going to write, um, in this case, I actually have two threads. So I'm going to write hello world, hello world. Oh, hello, hello, world, world. Yeah, go ahead. What's yeah. your name, by the way? Um, Bryce. Bryce, how are you doing? Um, yeah. pr pretty good. Uh, yeah. isn't, isn't it, you're not, you might get either of those two responses, or you might get, you know, anything whatsoever, because isn't print up not... So this is, the, this is one of the issues we talked about last week, as to whether these things are also locked in themselves. Yes. 
some streams, some implementations actually lock each stream right. individually. Some implementations um, um, lock only one stream, one of those five streams. Okay. Right. I don't know what Microsoft does. Any, any I comment? I the standard ease. I actually don't know about different calls like stood out versus stood air. Yeah. But if you're only hammering stood out with printf, that requires essentially a lock. Right. And C++ 11 was specified to also require that. Um, if you've got one thread hammering printf and another one hammering C out, okay. those actually need to go through the same. The same lock. And uh, that was actually fixed in VC. Okay. Previously, it did not okay. do as of Kenny. I know. Some implementations will fix it. So I look at yeah. GCC and all that. I think they use a single lock, and it's kind of messy after a while. Um, we're actually really blessed today having this kind of room set up because there's actually quite a number of people here who are actually quite well versed in some of the matters. So we're, we're, we're hoping to get, gain some of the insight from the description. Let's work through a little more example. Now, I said, okay, well, I really don't want hello world, hello, hello world, or hello, hello, hello world, world. I want hello world. So I, I come up with this idea, oh, OpenMP has this uh, thing called old pound private OMP single, which you can pretty much imagine what that means even though he's describing it. And lo and behold, I get hello world into my two-threaded program. What's wrong with this, though? You don't know which thread is running on the thread. Yeah, I don't know which thread. And what's the problem? I have, I, I have two cores, but what is this program actually running on? One core. One core. I really have just killed myself again, haven't I? All right, so I've heard about this OpenMP thing, which have tasks. Okay. And Yes, you can do t the answer to that question is yes, you can do tasks. So this isn't the only way to do tasks. There are many other ways you can do tasks, PPL, TBB. And actually, in the next talk, I'm going to compare them a little bit. Because that was the big thing that happened last week at, in Redmond, where I was um, at the, um, the Microsoft the Parallel, the Advanced Parallelism Summit. But here I've done it again. I've created some tasks, and I've printed some of them out. And the output is in red below. And what have I actually observed here? OK, I, what, I, what have I observed? I've got Hello world. I've got hello world. Actually, I, I should mention I'm, I've executed this program three times, okay, on on a two-threaded um, um, system. So I've got hello world. I've got hello world, and I've got world hello. Um, is this is this a problem for anybody, by the way? <laughs> Not for Yoda. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay with this. <laughs> this is how the world is in with tasks, because I have no idea what order they're going to be executed in. This is the way things are. Okay? So I'm a little slow here. Yeah. You've got the, the OMP single fragment, which says only one thread at a time will go through there. Yeah. But because you've got OMP tasks, yeah. it doesn't matter which order those are executed in by That's a single right. thread. That's right. That's right. And I have to use actually, single. Yeah. Sorry. Is actually just the single thread going to be executing those tasks? Right. Or is the block thread, the thread waiting for the other to finish the single region, is that one going to pick up tasks? The block thread. Yeah. So single just means block it? Yes. I'll show an example of single in detail later on. All right. Now I've got an. I've, I've kind of looked at this and go, you know, I, I'm all kind of okay, but. Um, something still doesn't feel really good about this example. You know, I really want to do. I want to really want to make sure that they all come out at the same time. I, I, you know, you know, accommodate myself. You know, to the to the idea that this isn't going to be executed in any particular order that I can I can do anything about. But I do want thank you to come out um, ahead of everybody. Okay, and here. We introduce the idea that tasks are executed at a task execution point, okay? Such that this thank you now will always come in front, such that um, hello world, hello world, and real hello, I executed this program three times, would come out in a different order, and, I'm okay, and I've, I've, I've accepted that as being the, the, the reality of my world, okay? So, so tasks executed at a task execution point. Yeah, go ahead. Is, is the task execution point the closing brace? Or, yeah. oh, it's as soon as it sees any statement that's not covered by the fragment. Yeah. Okay, right. then it's going to do all that. That's right. Okay. That's right. Oh, okay. So some subtleties right away, I'm going to compare this later on, but let me just finish with one more slide. I think this is it. Okay. I, if I want to execute the task first, so here I'm okay with this, but I'm still not too happy because I really want to say thank you after the hello world gets printed. 
So I need to do something here. Okay. And OpenMP has this construct called task weight. And this is the, by putting this task weight, it forces this execution now. Okay. So that the task executed first before the, ex the task execution point of the print task. Now, a couple of subtle things. Go ahead. Yeah, I got a question. Yeah. In that case, if you go back one slide, sure. and you had a really, really fast order and some tough luck, would it be possible that your thank you would come after the first puzzle? I have a really, really fast computer. No? No, because you're in the prime. You're in the I'm in the prime one, yeah. You can't. The single prime has got the curly brace scoping. Oh. So some so sort of single, single stuff that's on that Yeah. 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 So now. This might seem like the natural way to program tasks, but in, 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 many, in much of the world, this isn't. So I just came from Microsoft, and um, you know, Bartos and I were there, and we were talking about asynchronous, a wait, and then, and, which, is a, which is in C-sharp, is continue with, and things, things like that. Those are also, in some way, a kind of a task. Later on in that conference, we talked about structure, um, structure parallelism versus unstructured parallelism. And fundamentally, what, what, you, what I'm observing is that in the world of tasks, there's unstructured parallelism, where you send in functions and lambdas, like what, they say, what, what the C sharp continue with and, and await then does. And there's this model, which is structured, much very structured. It's very structured and it's scoped. Okay? I define specifically what things are going to be done in my task in a very specific structure or scope. Okay. And this is some of the subtle dissonances that you're going to observe in my next talk, right after this. But that's not for this talk. This talk is going to talk about OpenMP. All right. I'm going to fly through some of this, because this is not really all that technically interesting. OpenMP is not like an ISO thing. We are like a corporation. Um, uh, we have a company called ARB. I'm the CEO. I have a whole staff behind me who are like CFOs and, and marketing staff. And yes. By the way, um, there was a talk at Microsoft about in February about you know why doesn't C plus plus have a marketing have a marketing machinery? And really, no one really wants to have a marketing machinery for C plus plus. We do, okay. But it's also questionable whether something like this is actually effective. Um, although we haven't really made a whole lot of use of sort. There are a lot of organizations um, that um, that belongs to the ARB. Pretty much everybody in the, who belongs to some company in this room pretty much belongs to OpenMP. And that includes all the major um, computer companies like, like Sun Oracle, Microsoft, IBM, Intel, um, AMD, um, Cray, and a bunch of other ones. There's, I'm not going to talk too much about the difference between permanent and zone. But there actually is, really isn't that much. There are a whole bunch of new members added this year, including NVIDIA, Texas Instrument, and, and a lot of US national labs. Okay. The organization looks something like this. There's a board of directors. Um, there's one re representative per member from the open MPARB to the open, for, from each company to the ARB. There are a bunch of officers, and then there are a bunch of committees that do the actual work itself. Um, in the ISO world, I would probably actually live mostly in this, in this world, whereas her would kind of live in this world, kind of like. So in the open MP world, I've kind of switched role. Although I actually have roles in both worlds because I'm mostly a language person. All right, the history of open MP. 1997, being the ancient times, a whole bunch of people did try to do parallelism in different ways using their own constructs, syntax. Pretty much kind of like today in a way, actually. <laughs> Not too different, except that they were doing the tackle with threads then, and we're trying to do that with tasks today. Okay? They got together and said, you know what, we actually need to get these guys you know, come out of the jungle, get these syntax together, make sure it's fairly common. Again, very much like what we're trying to do today with, with parallelism. Okay? And then they wrote a, a draft, got a whole bunch of other people involved. And one thing they did smartly was that they, they realized they weren't going to go anywhere unless they get the big guys, the big guys involved and implementing some of the stuff. Okay? And a lot of other, a lot of other consortiums and, corp and um, you know, like multi-core embedded, um, open FPGA, have made that mistake. They haven't been able to get people to actually implement this, these, uh, these specifications. Well, not too many of them, anyway. So, hence it was born, and this is the changes over the, over, over the years. There was a separate Fortran and C and C++ specification. Um, it, it, it got merged, these two languages got merged into OpenMP, and then at 3.0 we added um, tasks for regular parallelism. Much better C++ support. I pretty much came on here, and that's, hence, that's why I was, not, not to say that I, that I was responsible for everything there, but certainly I love C++, and one other thing I wanted to, to see OpenMT do 
was do better with C++, and I'll show you some of that. Okay. Today we're adding a whole bunch of other things, and we're trying to move on to 4.0. Go ahead, Chuck. I just want to understand if, let's say I want to use OpenMD. Sure. Do I have to use a special compiler? Do I have to link with a library? How do I use it? Pretty much every compiler you have, including the one on your laptop from Microsoft. The whole, no, the there one, wouldn't be one on my laptop. Intel, IBM compiler already comes with these so options. GCC. GCC already comes with these options enabled. Um, it's usually some flag or like minus Q open MP yeah, or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Okay, so it's built into the compiler. It's all built into the compiler. All right. I think okay. the, um, the, the biggest thing you need to be aware of is which version of OpenMP your compiler supports. Right. Should I say it? I forget what Microsoft supports. I think it's not 3.0. It's 2.0. Yeah. 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 That's right. Because people keep complaining, hey, it's 3.0. <laughs> I know. I you remember. probably have heard about that. We hear that a lot about that. But, we say, but we're, we're, which is the which is the company? There's nothing we can. However, now that I've connected with, uh, with uh, um, uh, Gustafsson, I guess is his name. Okay, Nicholas. Nicholas, yeah. yeah. So he's really keen on getting back into the whole whole fray of things. So I, I, there might be some future there. Okay. Clan doesn't. Clan doesn't. Any clients here? We just uh, some guy from the University of Innsbruck actually implemented it in its own branch and he serious? just wow. relicensed it all to the University of Illinois license. And okay. We, so there will be effort now to reintegrate that into okay. the mainline. Okay. Exciting. So yes, OpenMP is almost as ubiquitous as um, GCC. It's everywhere, it's accessible everywhere. You can try it out today. It's got over 15 years of history behind it. Um, but one other thing about OpenMP, and I'll say it now, is some people look at the syntax and say, well, this is kind of, in fact, this is the one, what, what, uh, what Hood said, actually, is that this is kind of like industrial duct tape. It's unquestionably <laughs> <laughs> But it's actually like taping things over. And, one of, and, I, and in defense of, and, and you know, to some extent, I do agree with them. Um, one other thing that OpenMP has been always been trying to do was to make the language feature, whatever, I shall, whatever it creates, to be compatible on three languages, C, C++, and Fortran. Quite a diverse set of languages, unfortunately. And, um, and the result is that you have this somewhat, this ugliness that comes out. Okay? Try, 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 you know, we've been trying to design one language, trying to design it for three languages. <laughs> Go ahead. My understanding was that the C++11, the new attributes stuff, was intended to be used. The generalized attributes, yes. I mean, for for yes. OpenMP, but doesn't that kind of break that idea because C doesn't have attributes, Fortran doesn't have That's attributes. That's right. Are you actually talking to the author of that paper, actually? I um, <laughs> they, 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 they were, uh, when I wrote generalized attribute, I had this sort of background agenda mm -hmm. and using the generalized attributes as a placement for the OpenMP primitives in C and C++. Um, that would make it much more natural with the language. You can generate errors that actually associate with the construct. And this is precisely why I designed the attributes such that it always associate with the entity really to the, to the left. However, um, there were some um, uh, potholes along the way to standardization such that C decided not to take the generalized attributes. They would have to invent new keywords for everything. Um, it is still entirely possible for OpenMP to, and now that I'm the CEO, um, one model I've been advocating with the group is when the language um, gives you a certain advantage, like exception handling and generalized attribute, you should take advantage of it so that you can create equivalent syntax. To the, you always need the pragma to create cross-language syntax. Mm -hmm. But if the language gives you that capability, um, so we're working on error model, error handling mm -hmm. right now, why do it like error no when you can do it like an exception? Okay. Um, I don't know how much success I'll have, but one of the things I would like to do, one of the things I would like to do is add those syntax to support that. Okay. Questions? All right. So we just went over a bunch of examples about you know, what are, how tasks are done in OpenMP. Um, so let's get into a little bit of detail now in terms of in terms of intro. I think my talk finishes at um, one um, three thirty. Okay. Um, three fifteen. Three fifteen. Right. And then your next talk is. So it's kind of closing anyway. <laughs> All right. So like I said, it's a de facto standard uh, standard application program interface. It's actually one of the easiest things easiest thing to learn really. Um, the 
for specifications no more than about 200 pages long. When was the last time you saw a specification that was 200 pages long? Okay, that was probably, that's why it goes back to K and RC. Um, it com basically three things, compiler directives, which are in those forms of fragments, runtime routines, which you can call naturally as a function, okay, as a library function, API, environment variables that you have to set okay, um, from the start of the program. Interestingly, all of these are going to be talked about in our advanced parallelism talk following this, because one of the things we'll begin to realize is that learning from this OpenMP experience, and again, I'm not necessarily interested in standardizing OpenMP to C++. One of the things we're learning is what to do, how, what to do in terms of how to control all these things that the thread pools are starting up, so that you don't get problems with oversubscription. You need to the ability to control how many threads um, are going to go in there, what, what's going to happen to them when they're, when they're not doing anything, are they, are they spinning, are they parked, or some, in some other subtle way. Um, this whole thing is maintained by the, by the Architecture Review Board, 3.1 was just released. Okay. So when do you want to use OpenMP? Obviously, there are a couple of things. If the compiler cannot parallelize the way you might, you, you like it, even with auto-parallelization turned on. For example, a loop is not parallelized because some data dependency analysis um, is not able to determine whether it's safe to parallelize or not. Okay. All the compilers find some low-level parallelism, but you know to your phone that there's high-level parallelism there that I can use. Okay. Um, that's when you want to start using OpenMP. Alternatively, maybe you just don't have a, an auto-parallelizing compiler, in which case, then you just have to do it yourself. Which, and in that case, you have to issue explicit parallelization directives. Okay. So I'm going to skip past this slide because we've already talked about it. So this is some of the claimed advantages of OpenMP, and there's some dispute, obviously. Um, good performance and scalability. That last one is probably the one thing that people hammers us the most. And in every case, we generally hit people, you know, respond back in terms of, are you doing it right? And I'm going to show some of that example, okay? Um, it is a de facto and mature st standard, in fact, de facto standard. In fact, I dare say that we probably have more experience from OpenMP, from more users using OpenMP in the last 15 years, than with any other parallel uh, language systems. Uh, there may be some other ones that I'm not aware of. Um, but this is certainly one model that we would like to expose to the committee and let them know this is what we learned, not necessarily, again, not necessarily wanting to standardize it, okay? Um, supported by large number of compilers. Um, I, will, I personally would argue a little bit about requiring little programming effort. It's a bit of a two-edged sword. In the years that I've been working with OpenMP, I've recognized that this ease of adding parallelism incrementally, okay? And you'll see what I mean by that, because you can just slap it on before some hot loop or something like that. Actually, it bites you sometimes, because you might find that it's so easy, it makes, it makes you think that you don't have to worry about things like fault sharing and data dependencies and things like that. In reality, parallelism is still hard. Okay? This just gives you some tools to get you started fairly quickly. You still have to think about those things. Okay? Um, can OpenMP work with multi-core and heterogeneous computing, for instance? I claim that it is ideally suited for multi-core architectures. OpenMP doesn't address at all NUMA support or, or threat of MD, so don't, don't you really say that it's, it's suitable for multi-core multi architectures? Isn't it really doing OpenMP plus something else? Right. So OpenMP doesn't yet support a great deal of uh, NUMA support. It has just added a whole bunch of affinity capabilities in 3.1, and it's trying to add more. Uh, there's a huge... Um, hit, um, Accelerator group that's working right now for the last three years, although most people don't know it. It's actually a pretty mature specification to the point where they've actually issued a, um, a, um, a sort of a, a draft that allows people to actually work with compilers and actually implement it. It's called OpenACC and it's implemented by Cray, NVIDIA, um, there's one other one, two other ones I'm forgetting, but anyway, what it, what's I mean, and in Cray actually? and CAPS Enterprise. So what they've been doing is they've been issuing compilers already with these directives with a, in a kind of a reference implementation allowing people to try it out on their GP GPU cores. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip past this, but this is primarily saying to talk about the different parallel programming models, but just as a, just as a reminder, and I probably don't need that in this room, um, the distributed memory model, by default, data is private, where well, each thread has its own private memory. Um, nothing is shared. Data, tra data is transferred, and synchronization has to be coded explicitly. Um, 
it's very hard to develop auto-parallelizing compiling in this environment, as it turns out. If I make a change in my memory, no one knows about it because it's non-cache co coherent. The open empty model, of course, is a shared memory parallelism, where all threads have access to, some, to the same global shared memory. Um, data can be shared, um, can be shared or private. By default, however, by default, however, um, it's shared. Uh, you have to deliberately do something to make it private. It's the opposite. It's really, it's really essentially the opposite model as the, uh, the distributed uh, parallelism model. And under this context, however, it's fairly easy. It's a lot easier to develop an auto-parallelizing compiler. Yeah, go ahead. So the open empty execution model is fairly simple: fork, join with, and there's a master thread that keeps going. And whenever the parallel region starts up, it just creates a bunch of worker threads. There is generally implicit synchronization that happens at the end of the parallel region, and then you come back into the single master thread, and then um, um, you can start another parallel region. What I'm not showing in this diagram is potentially dot, 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 that keeps going along here. Okay? What happens to these threads while they're waiting for the next parallel region to start up again? And you could spin. Could sleep and they all have their own costs and different models and things like that. Um, OpenMP actually doesn't specify exactly what needs to be done here because it's left to what each platform actually wants to do. Okay? And most platforms usually have some sort of ways of saying that you want to, you want this, the sleeping threads to either spin or, 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 or wait or something like that. Or sleep. Okay. So in an OpenMP program, data needs to be labeled, and there are two basic types. You, as, I, as I've already demonstrated before, um, there's a shared and there's private. Okay. Um, the only, it's fairly obvious, when something is shared, there's only one instance of the data and all threads can read and write simultaneously. With private, each, private, each thread has its own copy of the data. You can specify them in this, in this uh, clause using a, a private, specifying the entire list of their, the entire list of variables. And in this way, OpenMP actually gives you very precise control about what, what, your, what variables are their, their property in your program. And one of the things that I would, I'm going to show later on is that it's important for you to know exactly what your variables, what are, what the properties are, whether they're shared or private in each particular case. Okay. So, so are the private variables uh, really thread local? Three, yeah, that's where they'll go. Okay. There's another one called thread private, which actually lasts the entire lifetime of the of the of the execution as well. Too. But this one's thread local as far as for that particular parallel region is concerned. Mm -hmm. The next one that starts will have different characteristics. I'm gonna show you here an example here what I what I would what I would do as an initial rec recommendation. Here, these are the these are the these this is a parallel region. And these are the clauses here, okay? They give you, they allow you to, to, to somehow attribute on this particular parallel region. And you'll notice that the first thing I want to do is to set up the parallel region so that every thread will execute all the code in the region until they reach the work sharing, well, uh, reach, reach the end of them until they reach the, the work sharing construct up to here. So just make sure you understand, starting from this point on, every thread can execute every, every piece of code until they get to this point. Okay. Until they get to the four. Until they get to the four, because at the four, it's going to split up, oh, okay. okay, into chunks. But something I want to notice is I specifically said default none, and the reason I say that is it forces me to think about what is shared and what is private. There's a lot of implicit defaults in OpenMP that says you know um, loop control variables are private, things like that, and there's actually a whole bunch of other ones. You know, if you haven't read the specification, you you might be surprised. Although in reality, it's actually not that many deltas. But as a good pra practice, force yourself to think about whether something is shared or private by saying default is equal to none. And now, I actually have to specify whether x, y, or n is shared. And here, private is, and this loop control variable is private. In reality, <laughs> even if I didn't say that, this is actually going to be private anyway because it's, a, it's an LCD. Okay. But if you're tempted to make a chair, you'd just get horrible crashes. Right? You would get some interesting results. Okay. Yes, <laughs> Not a, possibly 6,000 golf balls delivered to you the first step. <laughs> um, here what I'm doing is I'm distributing. So, in, so as I said before, once you get to the work sharing construct here, okay, 
what's going to happen is um, I'm going to distribute the iterations over the thread. Okay? You will do five, ten, or three, depending on how many threads I've got. You know, one thread might do, and since I actually didn't specify how I'm going to partition, the default is known as static. And that just means that zero to five, let's say you have two threads, and this, this thing goes from zero to ten or something like that. So in that case, zero to, um, zero to four will be on one thread, and then, and then five to nine will be on the other thread. Okay? Now, there are different ways of partitioning this. Um, I'm not going to go into it too much. Um, but most parallelism um, proposals generally have different ways, uh, gives you different ways of partitioning it. Go ahead. So, so for static, you mean that it's going to try to saturate all of the cores on the end user system, but if some of the loop iterations finish early, then it's not going to try to distribute extra work to the ones that finish early. No, there's no work stealing here. Okay. Exactly. And in fact, they're all going to pop themselves at the end of the parallel region. Okay. But it's not like hard coding two cores when That's the right. user has 16 cores. That's right. Okay. I'm not hard coding anything. This is this should be scalable depending on how many threads you want to spin up. There are and right. usually, in fact. Before the program starts, you actually can specify exactly how many threads you want. Okay. Something like n threads or variable. Go ahead, John. Yeah, yeah. I'm afraid this is stupid, but no problem. Do you have so you've got uh, your your loop's going to execute n times. Do you have? Are you splitting up the iterations among the threads, or are you having each thread do n iterations? No, I'm having each I, the first one. I'm splitting all the splitting the iterations among the threads. Okay. So. Um, what I'm saying is, up till now, let's say there was some code here. Yeah. Okay. Every thread is going to execute that code. If it says, if it says uh, print out something, every thread is going to print it. Yeah. Then you get to this point. It's called a work sharing construct, okay. which actually I think is a bit of a misnomer. What it actually is is a work dividing construct. Okay. It's not. Well, I guess in some sense it's a work sharing construct. Go ahead. Uh, is there a way to to go back to the um Every thread um, uh, runs everything after that work sharing Oh, yeah. Once you come out of this, it's now all back together. Mm -hmm. Because you're still in this parallel region right. where it spun up all the threads for your use. Okay. What kind of. So, all the threads are executing now, but you're only concerned with a single result, presumably here. So, like, like you said. So, I'm pretty independent here, as you can see. So I'm pretty sure that I'm, at the end of this, I'm going to update all of the X array with the values I need, just so that the work is done in parallel. Right, so you end up with one X vector mm -hmm. that was computed in parallel. Yeah. That's right. Right. That's right. right. Now, there are cases where I may have to sum the results up at the end as, a, as an additional step. These are known as reductions, okay? commonly known as reductions. And OpenMP does support reduction capabilities, where it knows that by the time you come out of the loop, because you say parallel reduction here, and it's going to somehow lock that final variable that you're, you're doing your reduction on, so that it will only pu keep punching in all the results that you have in sequence. Okay. okay. And the assumption is that everything up to the loop is just going to set the code, because it seems to me like you had everything executing, like you said, C out to get that side back to sure. order. If, uh, uh, even if you were touching memory, you all your cash right, so up, everything up to this point is single threaded until I reach, oh, this, until I reach, the, until I reach the parallel oh, okay. I see. Yeah. I guess the, the reason to put code between the blue and the orange would be if you need setup for your private variables that right. each thread had to set up. Because otherwise, if it was setting up shared, you just put it above the blue. Sure, yes. Yeah, so okay. So, um, this is actually kind of exactly describing all the things we just talked about. Um, the OpenMP team is always a master and the workers. A parallel region is a block of code executed by all the threads simultaneously. A master thread has thread ID 0. Um, you could do thread adjustments in terms of reducing the number of threads, but you have to do that before you enter the parallel region. Pretty obvious. Okay. Parallel regions can be nested. Um, this is actually a kind of implementation dependent thing. And then an if clause can be used to guard the parallel region in case the condition variable values the false. I'm going to explain that a little bit. Okay. And here it is. The work sharing construct actually is not a sharing construct. It's a divider construct. Okay. Is there water in this room? Yeah, go ahead. What, is, what does it mean to have a nested uh, parallel region but want the master code has put ID 0? Right. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Rob. So the question is, what does it mean to have a nested parallel, um, parallel region? Okay. 
And all that means is that in the previous example I have, it just means that I'm going to spin up another parallel region inside. Okay? And you can pretty much imagine how, how bad this can go, because it is actually going at every thread. Every thread, every worker thread is going to spin up of the same number of num threads that you specified before you enter this world, this, this region. So it's geometric. It is huge. Yeah. So some implementation in the specification, because the specification doesn't bind you, says that you could do that, which would probably oversubscribe pretty quickly. Or you could all grab it from a single thread pool, okay, which allows you to artificially limit it. And this is why nested parallelism is still implementation how you actually implement it is still implementation defined. Now, in, re in reality, what people have done, a lot, of, a lot of research labs have been using this technique as a way of gaining huge performance. Okay? They use this as a technique to do massive computations very rapidly. Don't forget, this model generally serves people with 256,000 cores. Okay? Um, so, on a shared memory machine. On a, shared, on a massive shared memory machine, we're talking about all the uh, we're talking about all the supercomputers of the world. Okay, uh, you know, all, they're living in these national labs all over all over the place. And then, and by definition, the nested block has to complete before the outer block. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So some syntax here. Obviously, we we support C and C plus plus. So I'm not gonna you know, go the labor it, but you could, and, and Fortran, is, and that other language as well, too. Mm -hmm. um, anybody here actually speaks Fortran? Oh, that's incredible. If you went to engineering school for anything besides computer science, you'd learn Fortran. Okay, or and you have explained to me what the syntax <laughs> means, because I actually never went to engineering school. Okay, there's a difference between having written it in the past and knowing it now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> My graduate degree We're was proud in... proud to have forgotten it. <laughs> 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 Instead of engineering, my graduate degree was astrophysics. So we actually, by the time I got there, we were already using C and C++. So you can do all these things. This is your standard um, directive format where you can create clauses and things like that. Again, I'm not going to go into syntax too much because you can always read about it. Uh, Michael, yeah. I'm, I'm curious. Of the open and key users you see, um, what's the division between the languages? Like, are most of your users Fortran, or is it pretty evenly divided between C and C++ Fortran, or how does the split usually go for open and key users? It turns out it's pretty much split along the lines of um, national labs. Okay. Uh, so one more. shop will be heavily yes, C++, heavily C, C++, C, C++, C, C++ C, C++, then C++. the next Argon, is it Argon or Old Bridge, is heavily Fortran. Um, but uh, uh, the net of it all is, I think it's almost even now. Okay. Whereas in the past, back in 1997, there was an overwhelming Fortran. Okay. And now it's, the balance is rapidly pushing forward. And now we pretty much reached equilibrium about five years ago. And now I'm beginning to see lots and lots of C, C and C++ code coming out in the And is it more C or C++? C++. Okay. It goes straight to C++. The, the national lab that gets it, are usually staffed with PhDs who, who knows templates as good as as good as uh, Andre. I, I know I read this. <laughs> and, uh, wow! I mean, they are just they are just diving it headlong deep in on, on templates. Um, a lot of those Spiro plus plus is all templates. Um, that's a program for doing astrophysical calculations of the temperature and the luminosity of, of stars and things like that. Um, it's like there's basically all. In, astro, in astrophysics, I, I work with a lot of astrophysicists, right. and it's mostly they, they go straight from Fortran to C++. Yeah, nobody lands on C for some reason. It, it, well, I know the reason. But yeah. It, yeah. Well, it just seems to be that, that C and the, the astrophysicists don't want to change their code that frequently. It's taken so long, yeah. but now it's, there's why switch to C when C++ is available. Right, and, and the, 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 the PhDs get it. They, they know that in order to do things like uh, polymorphic typing at, 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 at compile time, you really want to be able to just do it, go right to C++ templates, which is a great boom for our business, I think. Okay. All right. So here's a matrix times, but I'm skipping some slides because I don't think you guys want to look at syntax. I think we want to look at actually you know, semantics here. 
So in this case, um, we have two threads. Both, are, both threads are going to execute this code for different values of i. Okay? And both are going to calculate the sum here, which is what you're talking about. Because I haven't done any reduction here. I'm trying to keep the example simple. Okay? And what am I doing here? I want to parallelize this. So what I'm doing is I'm making, um, first thing I do is I turn on this OpenMP, this OMP primer or parallel, and I scrunch up the parallel on the fourth so that it's not in two different statements. This is just a shortcut. Okay? If I know I'm going to do a parallel and then I'm going to do a four right after that, just do it in one stroke. Okay? I set default to none. That's the advice I'm asking you to do if you don't know what's going on and don't want to make any, don't want to compile it to make implicit assumption. I am setting i, j, and sum to be private. In reality, i and j is already private. You actually couldn't change them to anything else even if you properly tried. Your compiler might actually balk at this. Some may not. But I've also made some private. I made m, n, a, b, and c all shared. Okay. I have a question. Maybe you don't care the types of the variables. Yeah. Sorry. Where do you declare the type ah. of the variables? You completely type through the examples. Right. In here, I actually have done it outside. But in reality, okay. I really should do it right with the four statements and all that stuff. But, but can you actually mention that they're private or shared before they're declared? No. I just tried it on the new and mm -hmm. no can do. So. No, you cannot. Because these mm -hmm. things are attached to the actual parallel region as clauses sure. from the parallel right. region. Okay. I assume you need some braces uh, in closing that for or not? Does it just do the next statement if you don't have? Here in this case, I'm okay, but normally you because should put some braces. Yeah. Okay. So here, what's going to happen is thread one, or rather thread zero, is going to do iteration zero to four. Okay. And in one particular iteration, it's going to calculate b of zero times j, b of zero of j times c of j. Okay. Oops. And then thread one is going to do five, six, seven, and eight, nine, and here's one of its calculations. So, if you actually did this on two threads, your performance would probably be pretty bad. It would probably look something like this. Okay, this is the performance in terms of megaflops and the memory footprints in kilobytes. I go in this way, and I would actually see the ramp up. Okay. Um, to the point, to some point here where I hit some cache limit and I'll start falling down. Okay. Go ahead. How did you measure memory footprint? Is that an average memory footprint or a peak memory footprint? It's, a, it's, it's, it's average, actually. I just use your usual tool that's available on most systems to do that. So what am I demonstrating here? There's a trade-off between how many threads and how fast you want to get it down to memory. And right. So it's, uh, Right? <clears throat> so this is for the size of bigger and bigger arrays. Okay. What am I observing here? As, I, as my array gets bigger and bigger, this gets really worse. This is the claim that most people might come up and say, this OpenMP doesn't scale. And in reality, any parallel system has this issue. Let me explain a little bit. The cost of setting up this parallel region, region has some cost in it. You know, internal variables and Obviously, underneath, it's doing p-thread calls or win 3 2 thread calls, whatever it is. Okay? If you don't have enough work for it, then most of this is just going to be over, it's going to overwhelm the cost of this, this startup. Or is it okay. the opposite? The first part is overwhelming. Yeah. The, the, the second part, you are scaling. Yeah. Yeah. The second part, I'm actually scaling. Hopefully, I have the third scaling. part, you are descaling. Yeah. The matrix here is just too small over here on the left side. Yeah. So, this is particularly due to the overhead, and it uses a condition. Hey, how are you doing? Is Andrew here? No. No, he didn't make it? He almost did. Yeah. You know, Andrew once but always says that. He'll sign up, go to the conference, and, and he probably cancels at the last minute. Yeah. So here, the last part, I'm scaling the threads, OK? And, and the key is that I want to prevent the um, prevent open empty system from starting up when there's not enough threads for me to actually do for my solution. Okay? And that's and for that I want to use a condition if clause to make it scale. With small matrix, don't go parallel, please. Because the parallel overhead of a five by five matrix um, is probably way worse than the overhead of a startup. Okay? So in that case, I want to do something like 
I demonstrate the if clause? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I wrote these slides like six years ago, so I'm just trying to remember what I've actually done. So here I say if it's, if it's a scalar expression, n greater than some threshold, then and only then do I actually want to execute this parallel region. Okay. You mean it's parallelized? Oh, sorry, parallelized. But it would be executed by a single thread if the condition wasn't met. That's right. That's right. Otherwise, execute it serially. In Silk and PPL, and they use a language called serial uh, equivalence. Okay, and I'm going to introduce that term later on in my next talk. Serial equivalence just means that if you execute it, um, if you execute something, um, it's in, in sequential single single threaded mode. It should be the same as if when you execute it with one thread in multi threaded mode. That is what serial goes. And I'm going to argue whether that actually is an important property or not. And I want to hear some of your opinions. Okay. There's also something else called serial elision, which I'll talk about later on. Okay. Okay, what do we have here? So here, I've got another problem. Suppose we run each of these two loops in parallel over i. There are actually two loops here, okay? And one day this is going to fail, especially if you have more and more cores. So those of you guys who are astute to the whole parallelism will immediately spot something like, like, like this and this right here. Okay. And what have I got here? Thank you. Question? Well, that's not, that's not going to fail if you don't have some way of expressing data dependencies. Right, right. So, here, what I need to do, and this is sort of related, is we need to update all of A first before using A itself, one way. But, but you don't have to update all of A first. Mm -hmm. You just have to update enough of, you just have to update AI, you have to update A0 before, before you, you actually update use it. D0. You yeah. don't have to update all of A before yeah. you update any of D. Mm -hmm. I got you, and I think that's a good point. Basically what you're saying is that you don't have to update all, that's actually the worst case. You just have to make sure that all the updates of A of I happens before you actually get to read it. Right. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to demonstrate is a fairly simple. Yeah, go ahead. Why would you not? Why would you do that as two separate loops? Um, I understand. For an example. <laughs> it's just an example. <laughs> it's a good example. Yes. <laughs> That's your problem. Um, yeah, you're right. I can, you know, do it separately, but possibly the the. the you know, in, in reality, the, the, the latch might be different or something like that. Okay. So, this is going to fail, and the solution is, for this particular case, is use a barrier when all threads will wait until all of them are done before continuing. It's very expensive, it might not scale, and it's going to cause, cause, cause possible idling. Okay. So, this is what you would end up doing. If we, I have, you want to create, ooh, that barrier didn't show up. What happened to that barrier? There's supposed to be a barrier there. Yeah, go ahead. Is there no way with OpenMP to um, express the data dependencies without using um, these sorts of global barriers to avoid the... Uh, is, is there any way to, to, to tell it to, 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 to just express the data You would have to reformat the loop in some way. Okay. Yeah. Knowing that there's some sort of dependency, you want a more optimal loop, so to speak. So how do I create this barrier? So a barrier is if, a th if one thread is doing some work and the other continue, then really bad things can generally happen. So what, what you want to do is you want, um, you want um, everybody to wait until I am done, and then, and then we can continue here. So here, the threads are basically idle okay, once, they enter the barrier, once they enter the barrier region. And the cost of the barrier obviously increases with the number of threads. Okay. So here in this case, when data is updated asynchronously and the data integrity is at risk, then what we have is between parts in the code that read and write the same section of memory, or after some timestamp, for example, I can insert some pragma OMP barrier, which specifically causes these things to happen. Okay. Okay. Now, moving forward, okay. that's pretty convenient. Now, the problem is 
in some cases, you actually don't want to wait. Okay? So here we create something called a no wait clause, in, in, in which case the thread is, no, is not going to synchronize and wait at the end of the constructs. Okay? It will fly right through if you didn't put that barrier in. Okay? And here, I demonstrate essentially what happens is that in a critical region, you can be used, you can use it to prevent you know, simultaneous updates. But this crowd, you probably know all about, know a lot about this. Okay, so here, what I've done is for the sum, what I really want, one way I can do it, is to create a critical region inside. So that I can only, so it forces only one thread at a time to go through the critical region. So your sum is shared. So, yeah. It's shared. Yeah. Previously it was private. That's right. So I have, I have a question. When you, I assume there's some OpenMP pragma to say, hey, this is critical. Um, there, are there perfect advantages to using the OpenMP construct for that as opposed to saying, oh, I'm going to go use a, a Windows critical section or whatever um, and then just take a lock? Um, if I make it known to OpenMP, can it schedule things better? Because I know with uh, uh, PPL, yeah. if you use their synchronization primitives, yeah. um, that permits work stealing and they're much happier. It, using like the kernel, uh, ones is correct, but it's slow. Is the same thing true for OpenMP? I think it's pretty true. It depends on what the implementation underneath is doing, whether it's actually okay. Oh, yeah, I assume if you request a dynamic yeah. rather than static scheduling, then... Yeah. Okay. That's absolutely. This is the kind of thing you don't want to do um, frequently. All right. So uh, this is just to break up all the components of, different, of, of OpenMP. Um, like I said before, there's directives, environment variables, and runtime variables. I'm not going to go into this too much because there's obviously too much to go into within about half, you know, about a 45 minute. Oh, I actually, yeah. well past that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. You know what? I'm going to. That's why people have started coming in. They're all wondering why I'm still talking about OpenMP. I just, I just had two um, questions about OpenMP. If you don't mind. No problem. Um, and and. I, so I work on uh, a sort of solution to parallelism that's very uh, different in, in the approach that we take, and I'm just interested as to what your uh, response is to, to these two, which is, first of all, when you're, you talk about the global barriers and not how they can become expensive, my question is, if you have a way to express the implicit global barriers of certain algorithms, say using futures yeah. to make sure that, it, in your example before, to make sure that the, the D matrix was never updated until the A matrix operations were completed because right. you wrapped each one of the A updates into a future. Yeah. If you have such a mechanism, why would you ever want to insert the explicit global barrier? The explicit global barrier, explicitly saying everything is going to wait means that you're assuming that, you're making the assumption that there's an implicit global barrier. Isn't it much better to just allow the, you're making assumptions about your data dependencies. Yeah. Isn't it better yeah. to, just let us to express them? Yeah, I, I don't disagree. I think that, I think if you <coughs> express it that way, it's actually a lot better. So, so my, my follow-up to that is that OpenMP is very excellent for about 80 to 90% of parallel applications, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. The place where it fails is when you have applications that have very dynamic um, dependencies which are not easily determined at compile time. Is OpenMP moving towards a direction of addressing that? And if not... Yes, we are. Okay. Yeah. This is why we're trying to enhance the task capabilities right. that, we talked, that, that we talked about as an example at the beginning. So that it can be, it can be more dynamic, task grouping, allowing you to group tasks in such, in such a way so that so that you can you, you can spin up different task generators and things like mm -hmm. that. Okay. Great. Thanks. Thank you.